Pleasure. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Bradford. Those that are already in Bradford, in which case, welcome back to Bradford uh, every day. Um, so as Ben says, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, polymer rheology and um, what we understand by rheology. It might, might be a term you've not come across. It's basically just the flow properties of materials, how we might go about measuring them, what influence they have upon um, end product properties, and whether we can get them through an injection molding machine in the first place. So this will be followed by um, some uh, um, uh, hands-on work upstairs on shearheometry and also on capillary rheometry down in the main lab as well. So why do we want to look at it? Okay, so why, why, why is it so interesting? You know, it's, it's far removed from the actual products that you've been looking at in the last session where you're actually, you know, you've got a solid, solid material. But the vast majority of polymer processing operations operate according to these things, okay? This is boiling everything down. So it doesn't matter whether you're extruding a product, whether you're injection molding, whether you're micro molding, they all pretty much involve the same principles, okay? And you can see this with metals as well. You're gonna heat them, you're gonna flow them, and then you're gonna cool them down in a desired shape that's gonna give us the product properties that we want. Understanding this, the thermal behavior, as well as the rheological or flow behavior is critical in informing the final product's properties. And you'll see that even more in a talk tomorrow as well. By tuning the process with the material properties, we really start to be able to control the process with cooling rates, with injection speeds, with pressures, whatever, okay? And as you've seen in the last um, hands-on workshop. All being well, we end up with our beautiful product. It's exactly what we, what we want it to be, and it does the job. So if we just look at all, all processes, okay, they basically start with you know, a variety of different materials. If you want to blend material A with material B, with material C up to wherever you want to get to, okay, they're all gonna get thrown together in a compounding operation okay, to give us some kind of benefit. We're then gonna heat them to go from solid into melt. We're then gonna process them either in extrusion, injection molding, blow molding, whatever it happens to be, in order to give us a shape, okay? Now that shape can be anything that we happen to design. So that's gonna, we're gonna form our material and then we're gonna cool it down from maybe melt into solid phase. And that's our end product, brilliant. Okay, that's great. So if you look at what's going on, if you break it down slightly, then we have a thermal process here, okay? And we also have a thermal process here. Okay, so that's all about the thermodynamics of the material, basically. And in between, we've got this flow, okay? Now, this flow interacts very much with the thermal properties here and here, and it's kind of dominated by that as well. So you can see this. You might, you might want to do some additional processing. You might want to stretch it, as you see in the die drawing. You might want to do some additional stuff on the end of that, but that's basically the process. And that works whether you're extruding, whether you're injection molding, whether you're blow molding. Okay, it's all the same stuff. So, <clears throat> what's the difference? Right. So we've got solids and we've got fluids. Okay, standard physics. Okay. So solids, basically, your stress and your strain are linearly related, and the gradient of that line is your Young's modulus. Okay. That tells us everything we need to know about a solid, a true elastic solid material. For a solid, strain is independent of the time of the force's application, okay? Whereas for a Newtonian fluid, the stress is proportional to the rate of strain, okay? So this is the key difference between solids and fluids. The gradient of this line here is our viscosity, okay? Or our gloopiness, our, our resistance to flow, basically. So how is that defined? So typically, and you may have come, you probably have come across this at some stage in your career so far, the shear stress is related linearly to this uh, shear rate, dv by dy. Okay, it's simply the change in velocity over a distance, known as the strain rate and as units of hertz or one over second. Okay, and that kind of works if we have behavior that does this. This our stress is directly proportional to our rate of strain. Unfortunately, or fortunately for us, it doesn't work that way, I'm afraid. 
Rheology is pretty complex, and it's complex because the materials we look at aren't true solids and they're not true liquids, okay? So this Hookean notion of stress versus strain gives us Young's modulus, and this Newtonian notion of stress versus rate of strain gives us our viscosity isn't true, okay? We have a combination of viscous and elastic behavior, okay? So these materials are known as non-Newtonian. If you were to model them, if you were to model a true liquid or a true fluid, you would model it as a dash pot. If you were to model a true Hookean elastic solid, you'd model it as a spring. That's great. However, our materials are combinations of that and that, okay? Hence, they're known as viscoelastic materials, and the viscoelasticity is a property of what we do to the material in terms of temperature, in terms of strain, in terms of frequency, in terms of lots of other things. So that makes it pretty complex. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's complex, but it, as engineers, it allows us to have a big parameter space in which to work, okay? So we can now tune our materials more than we can with solids, where we just have to take that solid is gonna act in this way. We can actually play around quite a lot with these materials in order to give us what we want in our end product. Now I'll show you some examples of how that works. If we just look at the viscosities of common materials, I've written common engineering fluids. You'll note honey probably isn't a common engineering fluid, but it is a fluid all the same. If you look at the range of dynamic viscosities in Pascal seconds that we can be looking at as engineers, you can go from air as in, a, in a fluid as one times 10 to minus five, and you can go all the way up to one times 10 to the 12, okay, for your viscosity of molten glass. Now, polymers are somewhere traditionally between honey and bitumen, okay? It's not a scale, it's not a hardness scale or anything. <laughs> honey, polymers, bitumen, doesn't work like that, okay? But there's 17 orders of magnitude here, okay, that we can play around with, and they are related to the solid behavior as well, okay? So, as we've said, we get a constant viscosity independent of shear rate for Newtonian fluids. However, you can end up with a range of these non-Newtonian behaviors, okay? So, here's our Newtonian fluid here, is this straight line, zero shear stress, zero shear rate, and then straight up, the gradient of that is our viscosity, fine, all right? However, what we have instead are more complex behaviors, pseudoplastic behaviors, dilatant fluids. You can have shear thinning, you can have shear thickening. This is where, because we're forming macromolecules, the molecules can align under flow and thus reduce viscosity at higher shear rates. So you end up with a shear thinning behavior traditionally. However, other materials will shear thicken. The example you can see on YouTube and stuff, people running on swimming pools of corn flour or starch in water, it will shear thicken. The harder you hit it, the thicker it becomes, okay? So you can hit it with a hammer and it cracks like glass. If you hit it slowly, then your hammer simply drops into the gloop, okay? In addition, there's a couple of other things up here. There's a Bingham plastic material, which is a what's known as a yield fluid, okay? Typical examples might be tomato ketchup, toothpaste, where in order to get it to flow, we need to apply, we need to overcome a stress in the first place, okay? Because you don't want your toothpaste just coming out if you turn it upside down, you don't want it all to leak out. You want it to come out under controlled squeeze, okay? And it's all by understanding the rheology of the materials that these formulations are produced. So in order to characterize this viscosity, and viscosity is inherently slightly complex because of this differential term in its equation, in its governing equation, this tau equals mu dv by dy, a material that's at rest, you could actually say it doesn't really have a viscosity. It only develops a viscosity when it starts moving, okay? Because it's this resistance to flow, okay? It has no resistance to flow when there is indeed no flow. All right, and that makes life slightly, slightly difficult. So we have to test it in a variety of different ways. So traditionally in polymer industries, this is the beast that gets used, this MFI tester, a melt flow indexer or melt flow rate device, okay? It's pretty complicated. 
you put your material in here, you heat it up according to an ISO standard or an ASTM standard, and then you put a weight on top of it and you count how many, you count the mass that comes out within a known time, all right? And this is industry standard, okay? I'm not a big fan. It's okay for very similar materials, okay? It will tell you how easy it is to flow something from A to B, but it, and you end up getting a value, okay? That's all you get. So you'll see when we go up the stairs, the value of the material upstairs is 12, all right? A little bit simplistic, perhaps, a little bit simplistic, okay? A single temperature with a single weight tells us everything we need to know. The viscosity, though, is actually a spectrum of behaviours, okay? All due to the molecular architecture, the temperature, and a variety of other things. So we test it using slightly more complex machinery, such as the one you'll be using upstairs, is this shearometer. This looks at shear-dependent behaviour. You can change the temperature to be whatever you want it to be. And it provides, it allows you to find out where you are between this pure viscous and this pure elastic behavior. Okay, so somewhere in the middle, that's where we're going to be. Okay, this allows you to take measurements of that. Now, the other technique that you'll be introduced to this afternoon as well is a capillary rheometer, which is a pressure flow. Now, the pressure flow is pretty interesting on the grounds that that's fundamentally how you make a product, is by pressurizing your material as you flow it through a die okay so it's almost it's a good replica of a true process however it's incapable of measuring anything about the molecule itself really it just tries to push and then it measures how difficult it is to push a material okay so you lose complexity but you get closer to the process so it's a shearometer which i think is ace all right um allows us to get everything, but at lower shear rates. So just looking at the shearometer, the middle one of the, on, the, on the last slide, there's a different types of, of geometry. There's a parallel plate, okay, whereby our, lick, our material is simply put into this gap in between this plate, which rotates, and underneath you have a temperature control plate, plate there. We have a conum plate, whereby we have a small angle at one degree, two degree maximum, uh, down to almost a zero point in the center, okay? And we have the cup and bob, or the concentric cylinder method. Now these are all good for different types of materials. The key advantage, the best one to use, well, the best ones to use are these two, fundamentally. However, they're not very good. You can't really use them for polymer melts, okay? Only for very, very non-viscous polymer melts. Now, the reason this is so good is if you think of our shear rate, this dv by dy term, okay, so rate of change of velocity with distance, okay, and our distance is the gap here and the gap here. If you look at the parallel plate, then your angular velocity is greatest at the edge, okay, and in the center, it's zero, okay. So that means you get a range of shear rates across the radius from there to there. So your highest shear rate is out here, and you've got zero in the center. So what it actually measures is the viscous behavior over a range of shear rates. Whereas the parallel plate, the conum plate rather, by increasing this gap towards the edge, that increases your dy term, which makes dv by dy slightly smaller. So actually, but it's going fastest here, but it's got a larger gap. So you are able to maintain a constant shear rate over your entire radius of your sample, okay? And these are typically very small, about up to 25, 50 millimeter, no bigger than that. The cup and bob, slightly more complex, but what you're really looking at is simply concentric cylinders. So it's a standard Kuwait flow. Governing equations are there. M is the torque, okay? So that's what we're gonna measure on this rheometer, simply measure how difficult it is to rotate, okay, at a certain speed. And from that, you can work out your viscosity. Now, viscosity takes a wide range of different um, uh, terms. In this case, we're gonna use eta or eta star pretty much all the way through. <clears throat> and everything's worked out for you, so you don't need to worry too much about that. 
Okay, so the parallel plate is recommended for viscous polymers. The reason being that the gap size here on the conum plate, which I say is the best one, you simply can't squeeze your polymer down to give you that gap size. The resistance, when you bring this um, cone down, the resistance from the polymer is so much that you'll never get it to force down without breaking a force transducer, okay? So you can never get all the material to flow outwards into that gap. So we tend to use this for viscous polymers. You apply a range of shear rates over a single test and then study the behavior. Conan plates, great for low viscosity paste, emulsions, oils, creams, water, whatever, okay? And the shear rate's constant across the radius. If you can, then do. And the cup and bob is recommended for light oils. Materials can't flow out of this geometry, you know, because they're actually bounded in there. Um, whereas these materials are bound in by the, by the solid nature of the material. Um, and again, we apply a range of shear rates. Okay. For simple materials, a simple rotational test can be used. Okay. So you can simply set your material and rotate the plate round and round and round we go at different shear rates. Okay. And that will tell us our viscosity over shear rates. So if you want to measure the viscosity of oil or water, or generally small molecules, okay, whether it's H2O or whether it's you know, a, a light oil, okay, that's absolutely fine. However, if you try and do this with polymers, what you do is you shred them, you rip them apart, okay? Because you've got these long chain molecules, as I say, they start to align. If you keep going and keep straining and keep straining, it's the equivalent of doing a tensile test on a, on a liquid, okay? You will rip the material apart. Thus meaning, when you start your test, you get, you've got one material. By the time you finish your test, you've got an entirely different material. And all the way along, you've got entirely different materials. So what are we actually testing? We're not testing that material anymore. We're, 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 we're changing everything. Schrodinger, perhaps. Um, <coughs> okay. But for these simple materials, we can just spin the measuring plate, okay, and we'll get the viscosity out. If you go above, you can get to around 1,000 reciprocal seconds on a standard rheometer using these tests. When you go above this, then what you tend to find, as, as you know, people do when they go on, <laughs> if you spin fast enough, then everything disappears out of the plate, okay? And there's lots of papers published whereby they show this high shear rate behavior where you get this massive drop in viscosity, which actually means they've just lost all their sample um, and it's flown all over the room. They haven't noticed, okay? Loads of papers about it, okay? If you go beyond that, you're knackered, all right? As I say, if you apply these high strains, then we move outside this linear viscoelastic regime, okay? And when we move outside that, we don't really know the rules, okay? There are rules being developed, constitutive equations being developed all the time for understanding viscous behavior in this way, but they are hideously complex and they all involve everything that we're trying to measure you need to know prior to actually putting them into the uh, viscoelastic tool. Okay, so what we try and do is main, remain within this LVE. Okay, and in order to do that, we have to do a couple of different tests. The way we get around it is instead of just spinning, we start to oscillate instead, okay? So we apply a frequency or a range of frequencies, but at small strain. And we look at the resistance to flow over that small distance, okay? Now, this not only gives us the viscosity, but it also allows us to measure complex moduli, the storage and loss moduli, the storage modulus, being related to the spring-like behavior and the loss modulus being related to the viscous behavior, okay? So we can actually, by doing this oscillatory measurement, we can get both of these terms as well, which is pretty handy. So these are standard flow curves. <clears throat> okay, so this is the viscosity. We typically plot in, in a log to the base 10 units, and this is our shear rate here. This is just a, a synthetic oil okay, is using car engines, okay, and what you see is at low temperatures, high viscosity, well, not that high, about one pascal second, and then by increasing the 
and temperature we end up at 0 0.03, okay? So you've got about a 30 times reduction in viscosity with an increase of only 60 degrees. So if you think about a car engine, okay, that needs to operate at five degrees C, certainly in this country, and it also wants to operate around 65 degrees C or higher. So when you're designing everything, you need to be aware of that because otherwise your oil isn't gonna be working in the right way to keep your engine, engine ticking over. For, instead of looking at these simple flow curves, looking at the oscillatory tests, okay? In order to do these, we need to know what the maximum strain we can operate at is, okay? I.e., we need to establish this linear viscoelastic regime. We need to find where it breaks down, okay? And so what we do is what's known as an amplitude test, amplitude sweep. And basically, we run a range of strains and we look at the behavior of the storage modulus and see when it starts to break down, okay? By doing that, we can pick what our linear viscoelastic regime where it runs to, and then as long as we pick a strain that's smaller than that, then we're in business. We can get decent results out, okay? So this is what the results look like, okay? So this is for a variety of vinyl acetate copolymers, so a standard material. At low vinyl acetate content, this is used for greenhouses in the, in the countryside. At high vinyl acetate content, this is used as a hot melt adhesive, or it can be used as a um, gel in trainers or, or something like that, okay? So there's a huge range of different behaviors going on. But uh, say just looking at the 2%, what you can see at the top is up until about 10%, you have a linearity here. As soon as it comes away from that linearity, you've overstretched your material. Okay, so if you want to test this, look at the frequency behavior or the shear rate behavior of this, then basically we need to be in this linear regime here. And you can see it starts to move down there with different uh, vinyl acetate contents. Okay, so that's how we do an amplitude sweep. And we'll, show, we'll do indeed one of those. These are the limits, okay, are around this point. And you can put a nice curve down there compare it with vinyl acetate content, and you know you understand the material enough. But other materials don't act in quite a simple way, okay, they're, they're, that's just a, a standard non-Newtonian. Yield fluids act in different ways. This is looking at some lemon versus some mint shower gel. I did this project just to get some training for one of my students, okay, so I had two shower gels, so we looked at the difference in behaviors between the two. Here's the lemon shower gel, and here's the mint shower gel, okay? And same brand, same, pretty much the same formulation, but clear differences in the viscoelastic nature of the material. You think about shower gel, it's all designed with rheology in mind as well, because what we do is we take shower gel, we rub it on, on our arm, say, okay, at a certain speed, that's our DV, and we rub it with a certain gap between our hand and our skin, that's our DY. So it has a shear rate inherent in the process of, of using this material. So it's everywhere this stuff's used. But anyway, you can see the massive differences between the two gels. The lemon gel yields with a much greater strain than the mint, okay? So it's yielded at this point, um, whereas here, it's just starting to yield by the time you get to 100% strain. So there's an example anyway. Right, and we can convert that back into a stress and then you can work out how much stress you need to apply to your shower gel to actually get it to come out, okay? And you want to design it so that people who are uh, elderly or infirm, they can also use it in the same way, okay? So you can work all of this out anyway. Right, once we fix a suitable strain within this LVE range, we then try and understand how shear rate affects the viscosity. So if you look at the injection molding process, our highest shear rate is pretty much in the gate region, which I think you went over this morning. Yeah, okay. That's where you narrow everything down to a small gate at very high shear rates. So you can be up to upward of a million uh, reciprocal seconds in this region. Okay. So once we've got the suitable strain, we're going to look at this different frequency uh, behavior, see whether it's shear thinning. Most polymers do indeed shear thin. So that means they become easier to flow the faster we flow them. Okay which is all about the alignment of the molecules and them sliding over each other 
okay, in order to ease the flow. So if we perform these tests, so for a stand, standard EVA copolymer, just using the same material, all right, this is the type of thing we get. We have our complex viscosity here. We have an angular frequency, which is pretty much the equivalent of um, reciprocal seconds. Okay. And this is our temperature behavior. So you see, I was indeed right, we're somewhere between honey and bitumen. All right. At the lowest temperature at 140, we're roughly at about, I don't know, 4 times 10 to the 4, so 40,000 pascal seconds at 0 0.1 radians per second. By the time you get to 100, which is pretty much the limit of what we can do on these rheometers, we are down at about 1,000. So that's a 40-fold decrease in the viscosity simply by shearing it, okay, which is huge. And we can play around with that to, to, to a large extent in order to give us exactly what we want. So there's increasing temperature. Clearly, the higher temperature, then the less viscous the material is going to be. Looking at the storage and loss moduli, they're a bit boring, but they give us additional information. So the storage modulus here, as I say, is to do with stored energy. So the energy that we push into the material by rotating or by oscillating. Okay, so this is our spring, basically. And this is our dash pot, okay? So this is our energy being dissipated by the material, by viscous damping, by taking energy out of the system. So this is, that's what's known as loss moduli, okay? If you put one over the other, you get tan delta, okay? Tan delta, I'm not a big fan of, but other people do like it. They call this, um, you can relate this to TG, to glass transition in thermal cycling sometimes but not with any great success that I can see, okay? This basically tells you whether your material is more likely to be described as a soft solid or as a non-Newtonian liquid. I don't think it really needs defining in that way whatsoever, okay? There's, there's, there's no real difference between anything up there and anything down there. It's a continuum and a continuous spectrum. Um, just looking at these, again, this difference in vinyl acetate content, you can see wildly different behavior, okay? So massively shear thinning at this high, uh, low level of vinyl acetate, okay? And down here at the low levels of vinyl acetate, you've actually pretty much got a constant viscosity for quite a range of angular frequencies, followed by shear thinning behavior. So you've got a Newtonian material here and a non-Newtonian here. Okay, so your material is right on the bounds of the uh, dash pot regime, okay? So you can play around a lot with this stuff in order to give you what you want. So there's the storage and loss moduli, et cetera, et cetera, okay. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Dr. Kelly, uh, who's going to take you to the, the wildly more exciting higher shear regimes. There you go. Thanks, Tim. Uh, hello again, everyone. Um, right, so I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to follow on from that and talk a little bit about capillary rheometry. So what um, Tim's discussed about rotation rheometry, it's an extremely useful technique. It's very precise. We can measure very small, um, we, we can measure, make measurements on very small amounts of material. Um, we get a lot of information about related to the molecular structure of the polymers. So we're able to separate viscous behavior and elastic behavior and look at um, yield and creep and <clears throat> lots of uh, kind of complex things that, that we haven't had time to go in, into in this, uh, in this lecture. But there are some limitations to the technique. So the rates of which it measures are, are quite small. It's not a flow-driven test. And when we use these materials in most of our processes, we're making them flow through a small channel, through a, a, a die of an extruder like you saw yesterday in the tube extrusion, or like the nozzle of a molding machine that you saw this morning in the um, micro-molding and, and um, ultrasonic molding. 
So we sometimes need to, uh, to, to know how our materials behave at higher shear rates than, than, than we can measure in, this, in the rotational rheometer. So in the rotational rheometer, we can get up to, to processing rates that are, uh, are similar to what we would see in a fairly slow extrusion process, but not so much a higher rate process like injection molding. Also, the, um, the real processes are at very high pressures because they're pressure driven. To generate high flows, we have to use a very high pressure to generate these high flows. Um, so our pressure can be, can be hundreds of bar in these systems. Um, and the geometries, the flow geometries that we get in real processes, as I say, um, th there's contractions of, of going from a, 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 a large radius through a, through a nozzle or a gate into a very small radius. So therefore, we, we use capillary rheometry, really as a complementary technique to, to the rotational rheometry. And most good research labs, either in companies or at universities, will have both of these techniques. They'll have the rotational rheometry for doing the more scientific measurements and the capillary rheometry for, for measuring, uh, uh, making measurements more related to the process. So the capillary rheometer, which you're, you're going to have some hands-on uh, experience at using this afternoon, looks like this. So essentially what we're doing, it's a little bit like a more advanced version of the melt flow indexer that Tim showed earlier. Um, so we, we put the polymer into a barrel. So the polymer goes in this section there. Um, it's heated up for a period of time, so we know it's completely molten and at very accurately controlled temperature. Then a crosshead, a moving crosshead like you saw yesterday on the tensometer when you were doing die drawing on the tensometers. A moving crosshead forces that piston to move down and push the polymer out through a very small capillary die, so a die with a small hole in it. Uh, we have a pressure sensor at the entrance to that die measuring the pressure drop through the die. So essentially we're simulating what would happen inside an extruder or an injection molding machine. We've got a polymer, we've got a reservoir polymer which is at molten state and we're forcing it to flow through, um, through a small channel. So the raw data that this test generates is really a speed uh, which gives us a volumetric flow rate of the polymer and a pressure drop. Um, so the machine looks like this. This is um, the, the RH10 capillary rheometer that we've got in our labs that you'll be, you'll be using. So you can see these holes here are the barrels where the polymer goes. This is the, the crosshead that that's, uh, moves down on uh, lead screws so we can get very accurately controlled volumetric flow. Um, there are two, two um, holes in the barrel and two pistons, um, which means one, we can either test two materials at the same time, um, but uh, more likely we'll, we'll use the second one to use a slightly different geometry of dye and we can get uh, an extensional measurement from this and, and do a, a correction. I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so the, the equations that govern the, the measurements that we make here, they're all based on, on this from, from basic uh, Poisson flow of, of a Newtonian fluid, um, which just tells us that the flow rate, the volumetric flow rate, um, is related to the pressure drop divided by the viscosity. And all these other terms are just, just the geometry of, the, um, of, the, of the, the channel that material flows through. So from this, from our, our capillary die, because this, this is a diagram of what happens in the die. So this is the barrel channel. So we have a wider uh, diameter in the barrel, and, and this is the smaller capillary die. So our polymer is forced to converge, flow down through the die, and exit at the bottom. And we measure the pressure at this region. We assume the pressure is zero at this region, so we get a pressure drop across the die. So from this uh, equation above, we can derive a shear rate at the die wall, which is our our processing speed. So that's just related to the, the volumetric uh, throughput and the uh, radius of the capillary. We can also, from the pressure drop, that gives us a shear stress at the wall. So we get the shear rate and the shear stress at the die wall. And the definition of viscosity, resistance to flow, is just shear stress divided by shear rate. So once we've got those two, we can, we can get a measurement of shear rate. Um, we look in a little bit more detail at the die. So this is our flow coming into the die. This is our flow converging down, flowing through the die and then exiting. If we plot a graph of the pressure drop 
as we go from the top of that die to the bottom, um, if we put pressure drop along the length of the die, it would look something like this. So the, the viscometric flow through a tube that we're interested in where we want to measure our shear viscosity is this region. It's the linear region of that graph um, where the, the drop in pressure is linear with, with distance. But also at the entrance to that die, we have this big, this big drop here in, in pressure. And that's related to having to converge the material in this top part of the die, to stretch the material, to accelerate it, to flow into the more narrow channel. Because we've got the same flow rate of material, and we've got a smaller area that it's got to flow into, so the material has to accelerate, and the, the streamlines of material have to be stretched to flow into that. So we've got a pressure drop that's associated um, with that flow. And what using a second die allows us to do is correct for that entrance pressure drop. So we're really just measuring the, the linear region here, which we're interested in. So if we look at a, a schematic die, what we do in, in one side of the rheometer, we use a long die. So this is the flow coming in now on a horizontal axis. So we've got the flow coming in at that side. Um, these are, this is the kind of a cross section of a, of a part of the flow. Uh, and it, it's rather exaggerated, but it's got to be stretched down to flow through this, um, the capillary region. And then it actually swells slightly when it exits. Because of the el elasticity of the material, because of the memory of the material, it actually swells a little bit once it's exited that die. But if we use a second die, which effectively doesn't have any length, so it comes to a knife edge there, then the polymer's being forced to converge down into the entrance of the die, just like it was in this one, um, but it doesn't have any length. So we're only measuring essentially the energy needed to converge the material into the entrance to the die. So we're measuring the, the entrance pressure. So if we measure the pressure in this die and the pressure in this, this short die, this orifice die, and we take that away from the long die pressure, then in the long die, that, that means the, the pressure difference between the two, pressure drop difference, we're just measuring the pressure associated with flow in, inside that capillary. So that's why we use the, the short die. And this, we can actually get a, a, an assessment of extensional viscosity as well. One thing we, we haven't mentioned, we, we, we're not going to go into it really in this lecture, is there's a shear viscosity, which is the most dominant thing in polymer processing, but there's also an extensional viscosity, a stretching viscosity. And this measurement allows us to get some indication of the extensional viscosity of the material as well. So this is just a typical data set from one of the tests, and you'll probably see data like this when you, when you run your test this afternoon. The, the curve on the bottom is um, the, the pressure drop through the short die. The data on the top is, is the pressure drop through the long die. And what you can see is a range of, uh, of jumps in the data, and this is because we set the test to run at a range of speeds. So if we run at one speed, we basically get one viscosity point on our viscosity shear rate graph. By running at a range of speeds and by the software working out when conditions have reached equilibrium and moving on to a next speed, we can get a range of points and give us our flow curve. So all these jumps in the data are different shear rates, different speeds. At each one we reach equilibrium, it moves on. So as I say, this test simulates what happens in, say, an extruder die or an injection molding machine nozzle. Um, we can get to, to pretty high shear rates, maybe not quite as high as you were seeing in, in micromolding this morning, and I'll talk about that, how we, how we get to those shear rates in a minute. Um, another advantage of this test is we can actually see the material as it comes out. The material exits the die and it, and it comes out as a, as a strand, and it flows down and, and curls up on the, on, the, on the floor. And we can actually see it, and that, that is quite useful sometimes because many um, polymers exhibit unstable flow at certain, certain flow rates. So um, you may have heard of things like shark skin, where the a polymer flow um, will, will or polymers after, flow, after they've flown through a die will get um, small um, kind of uh, marks on their surface because the flow has become unstable. Or, or there might be uh, a more serious instability where the whole polymer coming out, um, it, it kind of deforms fairly catastrophically. So we're able to see that, and we're able to, to correlate the visual measurements with the pressure. So we might see that at a certain pressure, we start seeing big oscillations in pressure. We might, um, we might see at the same time 
big oscillations in the, the flow of material coming out so we can relate those instabilities together. So there's a wide range of tests we can use on capillary um, one is the basic shear flow, which basically this is, that will give us a flow curve, and I'll show you some, some of the data from flow curves in a minute. We can also, in both, in both types of rheometry, so we can test for degradation. So we can run a test over a long period of time and see if the viscosity changes, if the material degrades at temperature, because many polymers don't actually like being at high temperature for a very long time, and they will degrade. Um, so we can test that. Um, we can test for something called wall slip, because all these, um, these equations which govern the flow, we assume that at the walls, um, we don't have any slip. So the, um, the, the, the flow, the, the walls of the capillary die are zero, and the flow rates, um, the, the speed of the flow in the middle is maximum. But that's not always the case. Some materials kind of slide along the dies, especially if they've got lubricants in the material. And we can measure that using a series of different capillary dies with different diameters. We can measure melt fracture, which is one of these instabilities that I mentioned. There's also a test, there's, we can take the, the extruded strand and wrap it around a, a wheel, a motorized wheel, at different speeds, and we can measure the force in that strand, which will actually give us some indication of melt strength. So the strength of the, the extruded strand in its molten state, which is quite useful for some processes like fiber spinning. So there's a range of tests that we can do. This is just some typical uh, data for a few different polyethylenes. Polyethylenes are very simple polymer, but one that's very, used, very widely used in, in packaging and, and, um, and that sort of thing, films. And this just shows shear viscosity against the uh, wall shear rate from a capillary rheometer. So you can see now that the shear rates we're looking at in the rotation rheometer, we're looking at shear rates or, or frequencies of relatively low, up to about 100. Here we can go well above that. We can go to the thousands and, and, and the ten thousands. So the processing rate is a lot more relevant for our extrusion process, for our, say, film materials. Um, we can do that very readily. There's something called a Cox-Mertz rule, which allows us to convert the frequencies that are generated in the oscillatory rheometer directly into shear rates. And for materials like polyethylene, which is a nice, simple material, they map on really nicely. So we get this information from our oscillatory test, and we get this information from our capillary test, and apart from maybe one point at the start of the capillary test where maybe the material hadn't been packed in quite so well, and we get almost a, a kind of a perfect agreement between the two. So they're complementary techniques, and they allow us to look at the behavior over quite a wide range of, of rates in this region. If we look at more complicated materials, that's not always the case. So this is some data for um, uh, PET, which is a little bit more, uh, more of a complicated material anyway, and this has some, uh, it's a nanocomposite, so it has some clay, nano clay materials inside it as well. So this is the data from the oscillatory rheometer, this is data from the capillary. Adding the clay has had a big effect on the material, but you can see there's, there's gaps between the data from the capillary to the oscillatory rheometer. And this is just because of the, di the different types of flow regimes we're, we're making the test under. So we have to be a little bit careful when we're directly comparing data from the two different types of, of flows. But as you saw this morning, in processes like micromolding, the shear rates that we were looking at there, okay, we're going up to, to 10,000 reciprocal seconds. The shear rates in micromolding, or even normal injection molding when we're making thin-walled components, may be much, much higher than that. So the gate sizes in micromolding can be, can be hundreds of microns, um, maybe even lower. So the shear rates, because the shear rate term um, is dependent on the, the diameter of the, the channel cubed to the power of three. So we have um, a very small, if our, if our diameter drops, our shear rate increases massively. So we might be looking at shear rates above a million, even tens of millions for, for very extreme cases. So we do need to be able to generate data in that sort of region. Um, so what we've done is used um, an injection molding machine as a rheometer, essentially, to give us extra information as well as the, the rotation rheometer, or oscillatory rheometer, the capillary, and we've also used an injection molding machine to really fire polymer through capillary dyes, so we're using the same technique as the capillary rheometer, but at much higher rates. So we're firing material through dyes at really high rates, measuring the pressure drop to see how they behave at very high shear rates. <coughs> 
So this was a setup in the injection molding machine. We, we built an adapter just prior to the nozzle. So we weren't making a part. We weren't injecting into a mold and making any product. We were just injecting into air. The polymer comes in this way. We have um, ports there where we can put pressure probe and temperature probe in. And this is our capillary dye, the dark blue section there. So we can, we can use a long dye and then we can change it for a short dye. So we can make exactly the same measurements that we can make in a capillaryometer. Um, this is just a photograph of the nozzle with the sensors in it. So that gives us a huge range of data. So from the rotational rheometer or oscillatory rheometer, we get right down to, to much lower than, uh, shear weights are much lower than one. In the intermediate region, the, the blue curve, we get our data from the capillary rheometer up into the tens of thousands. And even if we really push it with very small dyes and big pressure sensors, we can go into the hundreds of thousands, maybe up to close to a million. And then the, um, the pink data there, we can get from the injection molding machine. So we're able to get data into the uh, millions of reciprocal seconds. And for some polymers like polyethylene, like the simple polymer polyethylene, we get a fairly kind of sensible, predictable behavior where we have you know, Newtonian region, shear thinning um, for most of the region, even up into the millions of reciprocal seconds. We're maybe just seeing something happening right at the end, but pretty sensible, pretty much what we would expect to see. If we look at slightly more complicated so polymers with slightly more complicated molecular structures, we see a different behavior. We see the, 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 the Newtonian region, the plateau, but then at very high rates, we observe this, um, this kind of inflection where the viscosity seems to go back up. Um, and this actually relates to what we, what we observe in, in micromolding and very high shear rate molding, that the resistance, the flow at, at very extreme rates uh, can, can be observed to actually go up. So this was happening in this case for these materials just after a million reciprocal seconds. And there seemed to be some dependence on the material type. So for another polymer, polystyrene, which has got a slightly more complex molecular structure, this happened, but it actually happened at a slightly lower rate. So the more complex the molecular structure, um, the earlier it was happening, it was shifting left along the, the x-axis of strain rate. Um, and without wanting to, to go into too much detail because this is kind of straying into research results now rather than a, a kind of lecture on the fundamentals. If we plot three different polymers together at the, the, the far end of that shear rate curve and we, uh, and we compare where they have this inflection, then the polyethylene, it happens, uh, sorry, the uh, polyethylene kind of maybe just about happens at, at six million shear rates. The PMMA happened just above um, one, to the, uh, one times 10 to the six, a million, whereas the polystyrene happened earlier. And we're not entirely sure why that is, but we think it's related to the molecular structure. We look at the, the structure of polyethylene, polypropylene, PMMA, and polystyrene. We get more complex going down there, and the high strain rate plateau um, decreased. It became lower as the, as the structure got more and more complicated. And our best guess at why this was is because it's, it's linked to the pressure dependence of viscosity, because viscosity itself is pressure dependent. Uh, and if we look at, this is from someone else's publication who characterized the pressure dependence on viscosity, for these different materials, for polyethylene, it's relatively low. It goes up for poly, polypropylene and PMMA and polystyrene, it gets significantly higher. So we think because we're generating such high pressures that the pressure is having quite a big effect on, on viscosity. So we think it's a, a pressure dependence. Um, but anyway, as I say, that's straying more into research and, and yeah, I gave the, the reference for this paper, so if you're interested in that, you can, you can look at it in, in more detail. So that's about as much as we've got time for today. Just to conclude, um, by understanding the, the flow behavior of materials, um, uh, polymers and other materials, it's very critical to understanding how materials behave in our processes and in our flows. Um, it's critical on, on the process and the actual final product properties. We can, we can as companies, companies can make savings um, in terms of kind of setup times and cycle times by understanding this material and so choosing the process parameters uh, correctly. We can control or we can, we can monitor things like batch variation. We can't always assume the material we buy from our suppliers is going to be identical because it's not, there is some variation. So we can, we can track things like va batch variation in feedstocks. Um, 
And things like if we're, if we're introducing a new material into our process, if we're changing the material for a new one, if we understand the rheology and we understand the thermal properties, which is going to be one of the focuses of tomorrow's lectures, then um, we, we can do this more efficiently. So thanks very much for your attention. As I say, you'll have workshops now on both rotational rheometry and capillary rheometry, so you should get a real, really nice feel for, for both these measurement processes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. And uh, other steel collect lens. So this was this two HPTs were basically different formulation, different brands that had different behaviors. Yeah. The, um, well, we didn't really give the detail on that, but yes, the the different grades, different commercial grades of high density polyethylene. So it's the same polymer, but it might be different molecular weights. Um, crystallinity doesn't matter quite as so much because we're in the melt phase, so we've gone above, we've, we've destroyed all the, all the crystals. If we cooled it down into a product, then they may well have different levels of crystallinity too. But yeah, the main, the main difference will probably be either molecular weight or molecular weight distribution. Yeah, sure, and that's, that's an important area for anyone that uses recycled material. Um, certain polymers are different. Certain polymers are more robust. They can withstand many, many recycling loops and not really change very much. Others will change dramatically after one pass through an injection molding machine or, or an extruder. Um, companies that use them, we've, we've done research projects with companies that, um, that make milk bottles and they had a drive within the industry to, to increase the amount of recycled material that went into the plastic milk bottles, um, but they had to understand what effect that was going to have on their process. And we found that after multiple recycling steps, the rheology did, did change and they started to behave slightly differently in subtle ways, but, um, but enough for them to have to change their process to, to, to depend on that. Yes, I think there's a, there was a poster, yeah. Some work with NAMPAC. The melting mechanism. Well, we've got to talk on thermal behaviour and thermal characterisation tomorrow. So um, you'll hear a lot more about that about that then, and how to how to measure that in in um, in DSC. It's a little bit more complex than that because lots of polymers are semi-crystalline, so they have partially uh, crystalline regions and partly amorphous regions. So the two, I mean, amorphous polymers don't, don't uh, technically have a melting region. They just become softer and softer and have more, more and more energy so that the molecules flow. Um, but the crystalline materials need to get enough energy to, to break the, the crystalline phase so for the, the crystals to melt. Yes. Okay, well most of what we use here and all the demonstrations you'll see are all thermoplastic materials. So we can heat them up, melt them, cool them down into a solid, and we can do that an infinite num number of times. We can keep heating them up. Thermoset materials undergo a chemical reaction. Once they've been heated to a certain temperature, their molecules cross-link and lock together. And then after that, we can't remelt them again. 